Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Um, today I am going to be talking about my kind of timeline with diabetes and how I got from diagnosis to where I am today. Bear with me, it's been 10 years, so if I forget things, I'm getting old. It's been a while. I'm going to close these blinds a bit because I'm being blinded by the sun. So to begin with, I was diagnosed when I was just about to turn 11. I was diagnosed on the 1st of October 2009 with diabetes. At that point I didn't know what that was about. I just knew that I had been sick for a while. I've been really thirsty and really um, tired and I just wanted something to be fixed. And when I was diagnosed I was relieved because that meant something something would change and I didn't have to wonder what was wrong with me anymore. The doctors always said that they were surprised that I hadn't gone into a coma at that point because blood readers usually read up until like 33.3 minimals. Mine wasn't reading on a scale. Mine was so high it had no number and that usually means that people are unconscious. Yet here I was still like kicking about. I was in the hospital for a week. Um, in that time I was prescribed my insulin and given the basics about what I was to expect from this condition, made sure that I knew how to inject myself. And I remember being given this book, like it's kind of like an activity book type thing. And it was a book with a cartoon pancreas on the front that was called Perry the Pancreas and I loved it, it was hilarious, we colored it in it's somewhere in the room space I think but that was my introduction to diabetes and I was kind of I was prescribed um, this insulin called Novolog which was a mixed insulin that means that it was pre-mixed I'd like kind of shake it well roll it more instead of vigorously shaking it to distribute and I took that two times a day. That's a very old school method for dealing with diabetes especially as I was an almost 11 year old child who ate different things every day, who do, did different activities every day and was wondering why she kept going low and high and how my blood sugar didn't work um, and alongside that I was given Nova Rapid as a correction dose which I find myself using quite a lot in those uh, early days. Now I had to fight to be able to keep my needles on my person in school because it was seen as a risk is that they thought I could you know, harm another people, which I get, but honestly, I just wanted to live and have my needles on me and my medication so that I could take it when I needed to because the way the system worked was when the bell rang for lunch, I had to go to a different place to get my insulin injections, take that, then go and get my food. This was fine when I was on the twice daily injections. Which wasn't ideal, but like, didn't cause the problems that came with multiple daily injections and having to inject in a different place. Luckily, I, in my second year of diagnosis, I think, I was rolled on to the Daphne course, which is the carb counting course. Daphne stands for Dose Adjustment for Normal Eating. And I went on, I think, a six-week course. It could have been more, could have been less. I just remember at least once a week I got to take a day out of school, like take a couple of hours out of school to go to this course to learn this new fangled concept on how to treat my blood sugar. Because the weird thing is, is I probably shouldn't have been given the twice daily injection in the first place. I should have been put straight on to MDI. So I learned how to count the carbohydrates in my food and it was quite fun. They like brought out this massive like eat well plate and they had plastic um, 
foods where you'd push them to where you thought they went and like how much you think you would count for that it was good fun um but i once put what i thought was a scoop of ice cream into the sugars pile turns out it was a scoop of mashed potato but it looked like ice cream so i felt i was justified um so with that newfound knowledge of carb counting i was moved on to multiple daily injections or mdi i was put on nova rapid which was already the correction insulin i was taking but it was now my one that I used for my meals and then I was introduced to a nighttime insulin which was called Levomir. Now what a lot of people don't know about me is that like my family know and my doctors know but I haven't really told too many people is that when I was first diagnosed I had it in my head because I am inherently a perfectionist but is too scared of not being perfect. I felt I had to be perfect at this new condition I had been landed with. Even though I did not ask for this condition I felt that right out of the gate I had to know exactly what I was doing with it and I needed to be perfect with everything I did with it. I was sometimes met with exasperated sighs and eye rolls and why is your blood sugar doing this when it was outside of the target ranges? So I began to lie about my blood sugars. If it was 14, I would just take the one away and say it was four. If it was 16, you got it, it was six. If it was 13, I would kind of like duck it down to nine. I wouldn't put it at three because then I'd have to have more sugar. But for a while, I lied about my blood sugars because I thought everyone was expecting me to have a perfect grasp on my condition right out the gate. Luckily, it didn't go on for too long because it's really difficult to trick a diabetes team when every like clinic you get bloods taken to take what is your HbA1c, which is the measure of your average glucose result over three months really hard to say that your blood sugars have been good and have been around 8 all the time when your HbA1c is like you liar they've been like mostly around 16. You lie. You sit on a throne of lies. So after that my DSN which stands for Diabetic Specialist Nurse he sat down with me and said that he asked me why I was lying about them in the first place because like there was anger towards that of like wasting time going to uh, clinics and all and looking like a fool from people who were concerned about me but I couldn't get that into my head until my DSN sat down with me and asked why and I told him that I had to be perfect and that I didn't want disappointed looks or exasperated sighs when met with my blood sugar and that I hated disappointing people and he told me that at the end of the day and this is the best advice I can give anyone. At the end of the day, it doesn't impact your DSN or your diabetes team what your blood sugars are. Once they see you, their job's done. They move on to their next patient and they go home at the end of the day and leave it all behind them. The parents don't have to live through your blood sugars. They hear about them, they may be concerned, but they don't have to actually deal with the consequences. You as the diabetic are the one who feels every impact of your blood sugar and if you lie you're only lying to yourself and that you can open yourself up to some really serious complications if you don't look after yourself. After that I started looking after myself a lot more and that's when I went on carb counting and got moved on to the Zenshalin. And I haven't told that to anyone, so in the spirit of Diabetes Week and the big picture, that's my confession that I haven't told anyone. Until now, and now it's broadcast to the internet. But that's the reality of diabetes sometimes. So, I was on Nova Rapid and Levomir for a couple of years. Now while all this was going on, I also attended the diabetic camps, which were run by Diabetes UK, to 
let diabetics meet other diabetics. Now the fun thing is, as part of this camp, you handed off your phone and stuff to like a box, it was locked away, I just didn't bring mine, I just give it to my mother. Uh, and she kept it. Um, but you like, it's a summer camp, but with diabetics. So you're holed up in the Moor Mountains, because it's in uh, County Down in Newcastle where like the Tullymore Mountain Center, uh, Mountain and Forest Center is. So you're surrounded by mountains. There's no internet signal at all. Um, you're like given your food, you're given the carb counts and everything for your food. You inject in a, like every morning, you would come down and you'd be shepherded into this room where you worked out your blood count, your carb count for the day. You'd inject and then you'd go eat, you'd line up and eat. And this happened like every day for a week. And these comms were on every summer and I went every year until I was 16. The thing is, on the f like the f almost final day, like the day before the last one, the usual like last full day of camp, we had a disco in the evening but we were released into the wild of Newcastle during the day. <laughs> Just imagine a whole massive camp of maybe like 50 or so dialects. I can't remember the exact number. I just remember there were a lot of us. I have some funny stories, so like leave a comment below if you want me to tell you funny diabetic camp stories because I have a lot to tell. Um, so just imagine a ton of kids deprived of pretty much, deprived of sugar for an entire week who have only had each other as company for that entire week and you just let them loose where there is sugar. Um, and the leaders were very smart and camped themselves out in the big mods because that is exactly where all the diabetics went first was to get ice cream. Uh, I've met some of like lifelong friends from that camp and even though I've lost touch with a few of them I still like keep up with them on uh, Instagram and stuff and with Facebook and every so often like, they come back into my life which is brilliant and I've actually met up with a few more of them um, back with the project I'm in. So next on my story, I can't give you dates because I can't remember the dates and years at which I switched my insulin because they moved around quite a bit but um, I was then switched from Levmere to Traceva, which was a new insulin, which worked a bit more accurately to a pancreas, which I was all for, and I was switched onto that, and that's my insulin that I'm still on today. I took a four year break from it because I pump, but that was my insulin, and that is still my insulin. So every year since I was diagnosed, and every year of going to camp and all, I grew more confident in my diabetes. I was never the type to shy away from injecting in public or anything. I was like, why would you expect me to go into an unsanitary toilet to go inject just because you don't want to see me inject? Like, if you don't want to see me injecting, just don't look. Why should I have to put myself out just to make you more comfortable? It's pretty much what my whole philosophy was. And my mum was very much the, see the one who kind of put that confidence into me. So I have always been a bit more out there with my condition and not as reserved but there's still like nervousness when it comes to putting yourself out there in such an event. I would I would kind of do talks in my school where I would like load up a PowerPoint and explain about diabetes and bring my blood kits and test blood sugars and show them what was going on and kind of do my bit to educate because I felt passionate about this and I felt everyone should know about diabetes and what it was because I had only heard of type 2 and I thought if I've only heard about type 2 as the type 1 diabetic people aren't going to know the difference so I kind of took it as a personal mission to spread information out there. So in 2016 after seven years of being diagnosed and of seven years of being on a insulin pump waitlist, I finally got a pump. Like I had to go to the papers and all and put pressure on the the Western Trust to make me get one, but I got a pump and with that pump I was put on Humalog. I can't really elaborate on what Humalog is because 
I just knew it went into my pump and didn't really research it. My bad. Should have researched it, but I didn't, so I can't tell you much about Humalog. But it, it worked. I started on an Animus pump, which is this one. And at this time is when I heard about the Freestyle Libra. That is what this thing is that you may see every so often. This is a flash glucose monitor. But at that time, these were like a new technology and they weren't prescribed. You had to self-fund those. But my mum saw that it could give me a better control over my condition, especially with the pump. And she self-funded it for two years. Now, I went through two of them a month because a sensor lasts two weeks if you if you don't knock it off or if it doesn't feel on you, if it doesn't fall off, the adhesive doesn't work, like if the adhesive works and all, if it follows all the rules, it'll stay on for two weeks. And they were £50 a sensor. So £100 a month was being spent on me to have some diabetic technology. I was a bit of a cyborg at that point. I was being referred to as Tony Stark or Iron Man because I used to clip my pump to the front of my bra because that was just like I used to clip it here because that's where it was comfortable sitting like I didn't really want it on my waistband because I kept unclipping and falling and that was just the comfortable place for it but when you input things into a pump it lights up and I'd like clip it back under my clothes and it just looked like an arc reactor glowing out from my chest. So I happily took the comparisons to Iron Man because like Iron Man was my favourite Avenger. If you do the Maz, it's a hundred pounds a month. For twelve months, that's twelve hundred pounds. My mum forked out over twenty four hundred pounds. That's a lot, Jesus Christ, my mother sacrificed a lot. She paid that out of her own pocket just so I could be happier and have control of a condition that I didn't ask for. Then luckily, the Freestyle Libra got prescribed. Thank goodness. And that was in 2018. 2018 was when the Libra first started getting prescribed. Uh, so that was two years ago. So next up, and we're almost up to date on where we are now, I haven't really had that tumultuous of the diabetes um, experience. I've just been immensely lucky with how mine has worked out for me and I luckily haven't had DK in, in June 2019. There was the Diabetes UK launch of the It's Missing program which was highlighting the fact that emotional care was missing in diabetes healthcare in clinics. And I was asked, well, I kind of showed my interest through the lottery fund. Um, they were looking for someone with diabetes who would be willing to like speak for press interviews and stuff to kind of bring awareness of this campaign. And I, of course, being the vocal opinionated child I am, was like, I, I'll do it. Um, so I signed up. I was told, I was asked to do this diabetes event in Stormont. So I was like happily in my blazer and dress and heels and all, looking all dressed up, uh, coming straight out of like a uni class and talked about how I struggled with my diabetes and the state of my mental health with my condition. Because I try and be positive about it, but there are still quite a lot of serious like, like mental health implications that come with having a, con a chronic condition for so long. Maybe one day I'll get a bit more into like my mental health and diabetes but right now I can just tell you for there has been times I have not been in a good place in my condition and that is what I told two politicians and stuff in Stormont. That same day I was approached by someone to tell me about the Our Lives Our Voices project. You may notice that name sounds familiar. That is the project I am currently on and part of peer support and healthcare practice outreach and pretty much everything with. Um, 
I was told about it then. I got really excited about that project. And the next day I was welcomed to the project. We're just over a year into the project and I am impressed by everyone on this project. I am amazed with how far we've come. We've launched the pilot of our wellbeing program that we built ourselves. We've been on residentials, nights out. We've had meetings. We now keep in touch through Zoom meetings every week. And this is a special group of people that I'm really glad I've met. And the funny story is that one of the girls on the project, I was in her student film for uni and she joined the project and I was like, hey, you, I played a prostitute in your film. I'm gonna leave a link to that. So the last couple of instances is in November 2019, I was admitted to A&E. Finally, in December 2019, I switched from my pump back to my injections. It's worked out better for me. I was having problems with the pump that were for me. And I just decided to switch back to injections. And I'm happier in them right now. Um, right now they work for me and I'm happy to stay on them for a while. So that has been my timeline. Um, I know I've probably been a bit brief, but it's been a decade. What can you do? I can't remember every single thing that I've done because there is so many of it, but also bizarrely, I've done so much that I don't remember a lot of it. And maybe that's the best way to be. Uh, I'm so happy to be part of um, Our Lives, Our Voices. And we're doing some pretty great stuff. So if you click the links down below, I'm going to link their social medias and give them a wee follow and see what we're up to. One more thing is no matter if you've had diabetes for four months or 10 years or 16 years, there's always someone there who's going to relate to you. There's always someone willing to listen and I can be that person if someone wants to reach out to me or anything. Just know that you're not alone in this. Diabetes is lifelong, but that doesn't mean it has to be miserable. So that is my video for this week. Make sure you like and subscribe. Um, comment down below anything you want to see from me or if you want to ask questions. And I will see you all next time. Bye.